can't, um, can't get over it. In the light of his glory and grace, hear the chains hit the ground all over this place. In the light of his glory and grace, hear the chains hit the ground all over this place. When we look to you, Jesus, it's when we look to you, Jesus, only when we look to you, Jesus, oh, in the light of his glory and grace, we can hear the chains hit the ground all over this place. chains hit the ground we surrender to you Jesus we surrender to you Jesus surrender it all we say have your way have your way have your way This is your moment. These are your people. We are your children. This is your word. And so we surrender everything to you. Teach us, Lord God. Teach us, Lord God. Oh, and Lord, where we're challenged and it feels like a rip, would you apply pressure to the wound? Let us have courage in your presence to be led by you, completely by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Feels good to say that. My husband and I, We have not been amongst the believers in this way in, what, a year. So we are so grateful. You know, um, those psalms make sense. The psalms of ascent, when you know you're going to the presence of the Lord in his place. Whoo! It's good news, right? Today we're going to talk about being of one mind, one spirit. One mind, one spirit. We're hearing a lot about unity these days. And the reality is, unity is the legacy of the people of God. It's the inheritance of the people of God. If anybody should know how to be unified, it should be us. Right? Our text today is coming from Philippians 1.27. And it says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. One mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind. His spirit. One mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? There you go. There you go. We see the world right now separated into its factions, right? Separated into its factions and In each faction, they are unified. And it's only in the church that we feel this tension. 
we feel this tension because we can see a group of people and we're like, we feel like them, but we're a part of this, right? We see this group of people over here and we're mad and we feel like them, but we're a part of them. And we feel that tension in the body of Christ because we are actually called to be unified. One mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind, his spirit. There you go. And we're going to feel that tension until we get in his mind, in his spirit, so that we can strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to give you the end of this thing in the beginning. How does it work? It's Christ in us, the hope of glory, in each of us, right? Each of us has to walk in his mind and his spirit so that when we come together, we are together walking in his mind, his spirit, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We've seen the blessing of unity, and there's a blessing of uh, commanded for unity. In Psalm 133, it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And it's so interesting. We've seen the blessing of unity before. We've seen it. How many of you were like alive, and not just alive, but you were aware in the 90s? Okay. Come on. The bulls and the six peat. That's the blessing of unity right there. You can take all the talent you want, but if those guys weren't unified, they were all living different lives, but they were unified when it came to the task, yes? And they got that thing six times. Three times in a row, take a little break, three more times in a row. Like, come on. Does that excite anybody with me? (laughs) Shoot, we've seen it in kids on a field day, right? In three-legged races. Tell me that's not the blessing of unity. If you can be tied to somebody's leg and walk with them in sync, that's the blessing of unity. Marriages, that's the blessing of unity, right? My husband and I, we've been married now. What did we decide last time? Almost 13? Because we both forget. And I'm telling you, either you both remember or you both forget. Keep a happy home. So what, almost 13, you said. Yes, my husband, EJ Gaines, the love of my life. Yes, thank you, honey. Um, But we've, one, we've known each other since we were 15. And then we got married at 27, right? So, I mean, we had known each other. But let me tell you something. Get married, you become one, Right? in the sight of the Lord immediately. And then you go home and you learn the business of becoming one. (laughs) And the married people chuckle because they know it's real. (laughs) Oh, and in the early days, it was more like Mr. Attorney, because my husband is attorney, married to Mrs. Memphis. God bless you, honey. God bless you. (laughs) Because I know it was hard. Don't you shake, don't you nod your head. (laughs) But there was this one particular moment, argument in the early days where, you know, Mr. Attorney was arguing and Mrs. Memphis was arguing back. And I don't know even what we were arguing about. You can probably remember, can't you? (laughs) He said I was right, that's all I remember. (laughs) Are y'all praying for me? Um, But he was trying to prove to me that I was angry in this argument. And I was like, no, I'm not angry. Neck action and all. 
He was like, oh, you're definitely angry. All up in your face, you're angry. And I'm like, I'm not angry. And so then he pulls out his phone. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just taking a video of you so I can show you later how angry you are. <laughs> and I'm not proud. Let me just start by saying I'm not proud. So you know I do not condone this. But I may or may not have hurled the piece of pizza I was eating in his direction. <laughs> and so as I was weeping and apologizing profusely and cleaning pizza sauce off of the wall, I realized this is messy and tough business to walk as one. To walk as one. But we are still called to be of one mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind. His spirit. That's right. And so how then do we do that? So that we can receive the blessing of unity. That psalm is so beautiful. And it seems, I mean, it's beautiful in its face. But when you think about the history of it, it's talking about oil running down on a beard. I mean, that just seems a little uncomfortable to us, probably. But what would happen in those days is a person would throw a dinner party. And every guest that came in, they would anoint them with this fragrant oil. So that they'd all be walking around the dinner party smelling good. And that thing was contagious. It had a fragrance. And it was good to be together. And it was catchy, right? Right? How much so would it be if the American church was unified and everywhere we walked, we smelled like the fragrant oil of the Holy Ghost, right? That thing would catch. You know, like when you smell something good, somebody walks by you and even if you don't know them, you feel compelled to be like, I'm sorry, I know this is um, uncomfortable, but what are you wearing? That smells so good. That's what it will be like. That's what the blessing of unity is like to the world. Because think about this. As our country talks about unity, they're really talking about it from the outside in. I tell you what, we need unity. So you, start getting it together. <laughs> and the Lord is like, uh-uh-uh. I don't work in that direction. One mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind. His spirit. So the first thing we have to do is we got to get the right pronouns. And that's what we've been practicing. His mind. His spirit. Right? We're not going for the essence of his mind. And really the craftings of our own. Right? His mind. His Spirit. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain, eager, ooh, ouch, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It is about him. It is is about him. And that can be tough sometimes because I, I want you to understand practically that these conversations that are brought up top really do talk about issues that are real that we face every day. I am a black woman married to a black man with two black sons. Justice matters to me in a huge way. And there are a myriad of moments where the opportunity presents itself for me to be offended. 
and I have to find myself so deeply in him or it will all come unraveled. It will all come unraveled. And that doesn't mean (laughs) that justice should not be a part of the body of Christ. It means that justice should and forgiveness should. Right? Because I'm dependent on you to help keep my kids safe. So I hope that it matters to you. But I have to be so deeply rooted in him or else it all unravels. How do we know when we're operating in his spirit? Well, you know, there's a song my friend sings about the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. Anybody heard that song? I hadn't heard it till she sang it. Fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. I was like, why coconut? Why did y'all choose coconut? (laughs) Why not like anything but a coconut? Like people don't even think of coconut as a fruit, but that's just that. But it's the fruit of the spirit. How do we know that we are walking in his spirit? His fruit will come out of our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And I still forgot one. I told you I'm only good for eight out of nine. What'd I forget? Long-suffering. Did I forget? I I thought I said patience. Gentleness. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. So the fruit of the Spirit is what will come out of us when we are walking in the Spirit. If somebody were to go to our social media pages right now, would they say that we are full of His Spirit? Do we look like we're kind or gentle? Do we look like we bear the fruit of self-control? or patience, or kindness, or love, or joy, or peace. I mean, let's just start at peace. We have these images for a reason. How do we know when we're operating in his mind? Colossians 3, 1 through 5 says, If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds. That's that's an action verb. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then skipping down to verse 12, put on then, so we're putting off those earthly things. What do we put on? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. That part of the list right there, that's, that's mental. You have to decide to be compassionate. You have to decide to walk in humility and meekness. Having the ability to tear somebody down or to prove them right or to be completely justified. And to choose to be meek instead. To be patient. It says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Must. Must. I grew up being taught that if you have an ought against your brother, go to him. Tell him. And it's like, but an ought in the Greek is like an ought. Okay? Okay? Compared to, if you have a complaint, the first line of defense, what does it say? Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. 
That's our first line of defense. Why? Because the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That's how we'll know when we're walking in his mind. His mind. Because what you end up realizing is, I think a counselor asked me one day, because I do believe in counseling. (laughs) Amen. And a counselor, one of my counselors asked me one day, she said, if you had a million dollars and somebody stole five, how offended would you be? How much energy would you put into getting that five dollars back? And I realized, probably not much. I guess I still got $999,995. She's like, right. That's Jesus' love is the million dollars. And people's offenses are like five. Forgiving one another, bearing with one another, because we've been forgiven, right? That's how we know we're starting to operate in his spirit, in his mind. So if we're going to do it, we got to get the right pronouns. It's all about him. Second, we got to get the right perspective. We got to get the right perspective And see God for who he is. If it's about him, we might as well look at him, right? Turn your eyes. That works every time. Like biblical principles work. And I I remember the, the day when I realized that, oh my goodness, I'll give you ashes and you'll give me beauty. What a trade. Oh my goodness, when I'm anxious, I'll just express gratitude, and then I'll pray, and oh my goodness. And I know that sometimes it can get more complicated, and you got to go longer on the gratitude and longer on the prayer. But I am saying that biblical principles are true, and they work. And so if it's about him, let's see who he is. You know, Moses, after he had led the children of Israel out of Egypt by God's power and instruction. He goes up on the mountain and he's like, Lord, I want to see you. And God is like, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and put my hand over you and I'll pass by. And then I'll take my hand off and I'll proclaim my name because you can't see my face and live. And so that's what he does. And it's so unique because this is God describing himself. You talk about seeing God for who he is. This is him describing himself. And this is what he says in Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And it's so interesting because it, you know, as believers, we, we tend to lean really heavily on the part where we say, Jesus is so good, and he is. Come as you are. And right, come as you are. And we've also got to start telling people, be prepared, though. You cannot stay on your own terms. Come as you are, for sure. Don't expect to stay on your own terms. Because our God has standards. When he describes himself, he describes that goodness that, what does he say? The Lord, the Lord, twice. That L-O-R-D in capital letters is all about relationship. What he's promising to us, God, to his people. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Thank you, Jesus. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, which is three different ways to come about missing the mark. Accidentally, 
I did it, I did it, but I did it on purpose. And then I thought about doing it and did that thing on purpose, right? Thank you, Jesus. But then he says, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. And lest we think that Jesus is the Santa Claus version of the God we see in the Old Testament, Colossians says that's not true. <laughs> because Colossians verse 115 says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Same God. Same God with standards. We come as we are, but we can't expect to stay on our own terms. So when he says be unified, because remember, he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. Do you know how hard it is to show yourself without a spot or wrinkle anywhere? let alone being fractured. He means business. This is what we must do. One mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind, his spirit. Got to get the right perspective. See God for who he is. And remember that as we see humanity, humanity always has is needing and will always need a savior. So when we look at humanity, we don't have to be surprised. We don't have to be surprised when we look around and we see that people need Jesus. <laughs> because we're not better humans. We're redeemed humans. We're humans covered in his righteousness like whew, because my righteousness was trash. Right? That's the gospel. That we didn't graduate to any better humanness. We were presented. And this living life is going about the business of being sanctified like we go about the business of becoming one. Right? His mind, his spirit seeing him for who he is. The last thing we have to do is we got to get the right posture, the right pronouns, the right perspective, and then the right posture. How do we actually do this? Well, the trick is it starts with humility. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, each of us. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 7.14. And I know a lot of people have memorized this verse. And so we're actually going to start at verse 11 to get a little context. It says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When, look at your neighbor and say, when, when, I like that, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, here it is, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
when is very important. He says, when I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, that's addressing the weather, or command the locust to devour the land, that's addressing the economy, or send pestilence among my people, that's addressing the health of the people. If we have ever been in a place to pay attention to the promise of 2 Chronicles 7.14, it's now. It's now. We got crazy weather. Crazy weather. Our economy is struggling. And we're in the midst of a global pandemic. We can't deny that we need healing. We need the Lord to heal this land. And guess where it starts? If my people who are called by my name, that's getting the right pronouns and the right perspective, would humble themselves. That's the posture. We've been praying, 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 seeking, oh God, oh God, oh God. But we haven't humbled ourselves, so we don't even know what wicked ways we need to turn from. We don't know what we need to turn from. We've done really well at looking at what you got to turn from. (laughs) But I can tell you in marriage that has never worked for me to humble my husband. We, We find in the word that we humble ourselves or God humbles us. It doesn't, it doesn't work to try to humble each other. Humility is where it starts. And so that takes us to my favorite passage about humility, actually. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And I know we are hopping all over the Bible today. But to me, it's the only way it works. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, man, we've experienced that this morning, right? Then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Here it goes, the prescription. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Right there. When I am experiencing the blessing of unity best, say in marriage, it's because I'm surrendered to God. (laughs) And then I take care of my husband. And he's surrendered to God, and he takes care of me. And just like that, we're both taken care of. Now, we could each decide to take care of ourselves, but then we wouldn't be unified. You see the difference? If you want to be unified and taken care of, you got to be in his mind, in his spirit, which is going to require that humility so that you are concerned about others. Like I said earlier, I'm depending on others when it comes to to keeping my kids safe if they get pulled over by the cops. Because every black man in my life has had a scary experience. I am depending on other people to look out for the interests that are deep to me. But the Lord challenged me one day and said, okay, because here's the thing. He said, if you just care about justice for people who look like you, then you don't care about justice. You care about you. And so that's why, that's why I said it all unravels. If I don't focus on his mind and his spirit so that I can in humility do the things that he's asked me to do, then I can expect it in return. (laughs) That's my job, each of us. That is each of our jobs. 
to ask the Lord, what are you requiring of me in humility? Verse 5 says, right when it sounds hard and impossible, because I mean, think about that. If it were easy, we'd be doing it. If it were easy, we'd be doing it. But Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is your inheritance. When the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it's possible. When the Bible says, when we're beholding him, that's when we're transformed from glory to glory. Worship, prayer, studying the word. That's how we actually get it done. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Oh my goodness. You talk about privilege. Jesus had and deserved every privilege. And what did he do with it? Made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, not just that, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If our Savior began with humility, so must we. And how does that play out? How does that actually play out? Well, like this, let's take something that's been in our face recently. Cancel culture. Mm, mm, mm. Doesn't it make you feel warm and fuzzy? No. Everybody got a little nervous right there, like, what is she about to say? But here's the thing. Let's take the people who are like cancel culture. Where does that even come from? Why is there even room for cancel culture? What about considering that if there is this much room for cancel culture, could it be that we've not been holding people accountable like we should? But then come over here to the people that are eager to see it, the cancel culture, and are all for it. Could it not be that like the word says, there but for the grace of God go I? We learn when David sins with Bathsheba, kills her husband, gets her pregnant. When he goes to talk to the Lord about it, he says, Lord, it's against you that I've sinned. And I, you, I used to scratch my head like, no, brother, it's, it's a couple of people that you sinned against. <laughs> and we have their names. But the reality is, going back to Exodus 34, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of the Lord. So it is against our holy God that all of us are sinning. If you think about both sides of that for the cancel culture, whatever side you struggle with is the one that's for you, then we're having a conversation. Then we're looking out for each other. That's when it happens. It's got to matter to some people that this country does not treat all people the same. And then other people have to be reminded that actually nothing happens to you that does not pass through the hands of God. Because both are true. And God's throne is built on justice and righteousness. 
So it matters to him for sure. But whatever gets stuck in your craw, that's where the humility has to come in so that we can be of one mind and one spirit. So where is that place for you today? Where's that place for you? Is it protecting yourself because you don't think others will? Is it protecting your rights because you like how life is going? Where's that place? Oh, I know mine. Whew. But the reality is, I know that we are called to walk with one mind, one spirit. Whose mind? Whose spirit? His mind. His spirit. And I got to remember that it's about him. See him clearly and get in the right posture. One of humility. Follow my Lord right through suffering and into his glorious presence. Pastor Henry, can you come? What is that place for you? His mind, his spirit.